I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's great to be here again. I hope uh, uh, we've been having a little bit of uh, people going out on vacation or something, or they didn't just come because they heard that I was preaching and pastor wasn't. What was the reason, right? <laughs> hey, I commend the youth, those guys that got up here. I, I know if I had a mic in my hand, it would be going that way too. That's why pastor and I use a headset, so the mic doesn't go all over the place. But guys, great job. I'm so glad for what God is doing through Brad and the group over there and the leaders of the youth group, and it's so great to see the results in the young lives, you know. I think I've known Destiny for a while now. I don't know how long I've known her, but for a long time, that's the most I've ever heard her say. So that's awesome. That's really, really good. Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay, before we get started. Lord God, Father, we love you. Father, we believe. We certainly do. That's why we're here today. That's why we gather together, Lord, because we believe in you. So, Father, be with us this morning. I pray that you speak to us, Father. Do not allow my humanness, Father, to interfere with your message this morning. But speak to our hearts and to our minds, Lord. Let us know what you want us to walk out of here with this morning, Father. And then give us the courage to apply it to our lives, Lord. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, you know, the whole summer we've been studying the Apostles' Creed. And we're coming to the end of it now. We're coming to the last few weeks of the Apostles' Creed. But I hope you have enjoyed this study as much as I have and that you have learned as much as I have. It's been really instrumental to me. And now I think that we have a tool. We have a great tool in our hands to, in a short way and in a clear way, describe to somebody else what we actually believe, right? And if you didn't know before how to describe everything you believe, now you have a great tool in your hand for that. So we have studied a few things, just as a matter of review. We have studied about God the Father, the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, right? That's how we started with the Apostles' Creed. Then we studied about Jesus Christ, his only son, the Christ, the Messiah, how he came to, the, uh, to life. He was here on earth, and he lived, he suffered, he was crucified, he died, he was buried, and then he raised from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. We have studied all that during the summer. And last week, Pastor Brian brought us a message on the Holy Spirit of God. So in this last few weeks that we have left in our study, we're going to focus ourselves on the church, on the body of Christ. And what does it mean? What does it mean to be the church? And I want to start this morning, if you allow me, by uh, talking about what we're going to talk today, but using my family as an example of what we're going to talk about today. So bear with me for a couple of minutes here. I hope I don't bore you with this. But I just want to make a point, and I hope at the end of it, you get it. Okay? And I'm going to use also the Spanish surnames in my family so you understand the difference. In Spanish, you know, I'm not known as Jose Santiago. I'm known as Jose Joaquin Santiago Nunez. Okay, and there is a purpose for that. I have two last names, Santiago and Nunez. Santiago comes from my father's side of the family, and Nunez comes from my mother's side of the family. Nunez was my grandfather's last name on my mother's side, and Santiago was my grandfather's last name on my father's side. So that's how we know each other. And so I'm going to use two last names on every family just so you get the the meaning of this. So I'm going to start with my family. My family in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic will be known as the Santiago Santos family. And I have a picture up there to, to show you. Can we put the picture up, guys? I have the Santiago family, Santiago Santos family. That is my family. Okay, my wife and myself and my three sons. That is my immediate family, my local family. And though I belong to my immediate family, I also belong to another family. And that is the Santiago Nunez family. You see, the Santiago Nunez family is the family of my parents. 
Santiago is my dad. Nunez is my mom. And you can see them there, my sister in the bottom. We are the Santiago Nunez family. So even though I, become, I belong to the Santiago Santos family, I also belong to the Santiago Nunez family. Now, I don't only belong to that family. I also belong to the Gomez Santiago family because, you see, my sister has her own family. And, her si and my sister's family is the Gomez Santiago family. Joe, his last name is Gomez, and my sister's last name is Santiago. But I don't only belong to that one. I also belong to the Santiago Rivera family, which is my brother. I have a stepbrother that lives in, in, in Arizona. And so I belong to his family as well. But that doesn't stop there. You see, my son has his own family, and that is the Santiago Stella family. And I belong to that family as well. You see, my son with his wife and my grandkids there. They're not his kids, they're my grandkids. Okay, let's get that clear right away. Now, if I was to go on my father's side of the family, we have a lot of family there in Puerto Rico that I don't even know. So we're not going to go there because we want to finish today, right? Uh, so, but I'm going to go on my wife's side of the family, on my mom's side of the family, which is the Cuban side of, of our family, right? So I also belong to the Nunez Jervis family. And there you see my grandfather and my grandmother with my mother a couple of days ago. <laughs> but from there, I also belong to the Watler Nunez family. See, we have family from Grand Cayman, and my aunt was married to, to this man from Grand Cayman, and so was one of my grandparents was from Grand Cayman. So this is the Grand Cayman side of my family. But I not only belong to the Watler Nunez family. They're all over the place, by the way, in Georgia, Nevada, all over. I also belong to the Fernandez Nunez family. And some of these ladies, I'm putting them by themselves because they're like, the one in the yellow is 95 years old. So the husband didn't last that long. And I noticed that. I was thinking this weekend, you know, None of the husbands of my aunts lasted <laughs> as long as they did. And you know what? The same thing happened on my wife's side. None of the men lasted. I, I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Uh, let me go back. Let me go back. Uh, so where was I? I was in the Fernandez Nunez family. Okay. From there, I belong to the Nunez Nunez family. One of my aunts married a guy with the same last name. And they're both Cuban, Nunez, Nunez family. And from there, the Diaz Servo Nunez family. We'll move a little bit quicker here. The Diaz Servo Nunez family lives in New Jersey and in, in Cuba as well. But from there, we go to the Bonilla Nunez family. See, my, my other aunt, my Aunt Clara, married a Mexican. So I have a whole Mexican family. All right, the Bonilla Nunez family, they're all Mexican. And I also have the Galindo Nunez family where my, my, my cousin lives in in Washington State, his mom and his dad already passed away, my aunt, but, uh, but that's the Galindo Nunez family. And I'm just getting started. On the Dominican side of the Santiago Santos family, <laughs> we belong to the Santos Valdez family, okay? This is my, my wife in the middle, her mother on the side, and all her brothers and sisters, okay? This is a huge family. They're all over the Dominican Republic. They're in Boston. They're in New York. I mean, you name it, they're there. And when we least know it, somebody shows up. There's another one. But they have the Mies Santos family, and we'll go quickly. The Irisarri Santos family, and the Santos Lora family, and on and on and on. And I hope you get the point. This is the thing. Though I belong to all that family, the Santiago Santos family, is the local representation of my family. See, and though I belong to that large family, many of whom I don't even know, my immediate responsibility is to my local family. And you see, that doesn't only happen in the Santiago Santos household. That happens in the church. See, Hollywood Community Church is a local representation of the body of Christ. Amen. We got brothers and sisters that we don't even know that belong to the body of Christ. But here at HCC, we are the local representation of that family.
So, as we talk today about the Holy Catholic Church, and I'm going to explain those terms because I know many of you, the skin a little bit crows a little bit when you hear that stuff, especially in the Spanish service, you should see that. But I, I want you to have a picture of the local representation of a larger family. I want you to have that picture in your mind. Okay, so we read in the Apostles' Creed this morning, the statement that we're, that we're studying today says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. So we're going to start unpacking this, st this statement this morning, and we're going to take the first part, the Holy Catholic Church. What does that mean? And there's two things in there that I want to unpack, Okay. So the first one is the holy body of Christ, the holy church. And I'm going to be using the term body of Christ a lot this morning. But I'm also going to be using the word church a lot. And I know you like me. If you're like me, some of us or many of us have said, hey, I'm going to church. Or somebody asks you, do you go to church? Or, yeah, I go to church on Wednesday nights. I go to church on Sunday mornings. If you're like Stan Dundee, you come to church every single day just because he wants to talk to me. Right? Some of us come to church on Saturday, and we use the term, right? When, when I had my kids were little at home, it's, guys, get ready, we're going to church. And we all have used that term to indicate the facility or the building where we meet at, correct? We go to church. But in reality, the word church means a lot more than that. There are actually two words in the Bible that are translated, when they are translated into the English language, they are translated church. But you have two words, and I am not a Greek scholar, so please forgive my pronunciation of these words, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I just want you to know them so you can understand the difference. The first word is ecclesia. Ecclesia. That means church in English, okay? The, the meaning of the word ecclesia is the called out ones or an assembly, a gathering of people for a common purpose, ecclesia. And if you want to circle that word, that is the meaning of the word church for us this morning. Okay? The other word is the word kiriakon, which means a holy place or a temple dedicated to the Lord. So this facility will be a kiriakon, a temple, but the gathering of the people, us, is the ecclesia, la iglesia, the church, okay? Now, you see the difference between the two words, and we're going to concentrate on the word ecclesia, the gathering, okay? And if you remember, the gathering doesn't have, doesn't have to happen in a temple. If you go to the book of Acts, they used to meet where? At homes, right? In houses, in homes. Last Wednesday night, I had a meeting in my house, and the Spanish people came in there, and we studied the Bible, we pray together, right? We have fellowship well until the hours of the night. We were the church in my house last Wednesday night, okay? We were a gathering of people getting together for a common purpose. Now, I understand because the definition is like that. I want to make it crystal, crystal clear for you. The church is not, this morning, the church is not the building or the structure, okay? The church is not a philosophy or our denomination, okay? You don't really go to a Baptist church, okay? You gather with your people and your denomination is Baptist, but in reality, your church is not the denomination. The church is not our traditions either. And the church is not the music we play, we, we hear the term contemporary church, right? It's not the music we play. It's not the programs we have. The church is you and me. The ecclesia, la iglesia, the gathering of the people. We are the called out ones, okay? Now, that's a very general definition, and I understand that. And because of the definition, you can really have any kind of church, Right? If you just call a group of people together for any reason, we're having church, you can say. And so I got interested this week, and you know, nowadays we Google everything. I don't know about you, but I do. So I had to do it. I went into Google and put the church off in his search. Wow, you wouldn't believe what came up. I just picked a few. I just picked a few. First one, of course, the church of Google. 
<laughs> there is the church of Google. The second one is even more interesting, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Now, what do you do to belong? I don't know. I like this one, the Church of the Subgenius. Now, if it was the Church of the Genius, I couldn't belong, but at least this one I could, right? Then we have the Church of Satan. We've heard of that one. The Church of All Worlds. I like this next one, the Church of Reality. Their motto is, if it's real, we believe it. I love that one, the church of reality. Now, the next one I chose to put it on the list because I was trying to convince all week for my wife to become a member, but it didn't work. It's called the church of stop shopping. <laughs> then I found the church of nobody. Now, how can, you, <laughs> how can you have a church of nobody when a church means a gathering of people? When you have somebody, you no longer have the church of nobody. I don't understand that one. <laughs> and the last one is the church of non-believers. But that one, I also have a, a, a thing with it because if, if you, to become a member of the church of non-believers, you got to believe in the church of non-believers. But now you believe, so you're not a non-believer anymore, so you can't be a member of the church anymore. Right? I don't know. But anyways, let's get serious here. So I'm glad. I'm glad that the creed doesn't say, I believe in the church. That's not what the creed says, Right? He specifies the church. He says, I believe in the holy Catholic church. So what does it mean by saying, I believe in the holy church? What does it mean to be the holy body of Christ? The word holy means this. Holiness means that we are set apart. Holiness means that we are set apart. We are not only the called out ones. We are the called out ones as a holy assembly as a holy gathering of people, people that come together to worship the one true holy God. See, we're not just any church. We are a holy church. But holiness also speaks about our moral character. See, we personally and as a church, we need to display the moral character of God. That speaks to holiness, the moral character of God. God said in 1 Peter 1.16, be holy. Why? Because I am holy. So as a church, we must demonstrate the holy character of God or the moral character of God. And the process of us becoming holy, because it takes a process. You know, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, immediately you're not holy personally. You know, spiritually you are. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few. But you know, the minute, the second you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, all your thoughts don't just go away and all your bad habits don't just go away. There is a process of that. And that process is called the process of what? Sanctification. Right? We have talked about that before. And we see that clearly in the passage that we're going to read today. Go with me to Ephesians 5, if you have your Bibles. We're going to read a couple of verses on Ephesians 5, and then later on we're going to go to Ephesians 4. But we're going to see this reality in Ephesians 5. I'm reading out of the New uh, International Version. And, and Jesus is talking about husbands and wives, but he's, uh, but he's talking, I'm sorry, Paul is talking about husbands and wives. But he says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, and says verse 26, to make her holy, how? Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And later Paul says, well, this is a, a whole mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. You see, there is a process of sanctification, and we see it there where he says that Christ is making us holy by the cleansing, by using the water. What is the water? The Word of God. So as we hear the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, as we learn the Word of God, there is a cleansing that is happening in my life. There is a sanctification process that is taking place in my life through the word of God. Later on in John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them. He's praying to God the Father for us. He says, sanctify them by the truth. But then he clarifies. He says, the word is truth. Your word is truth. 
To see, to sanctify them means exactly the same thing. It means to make them holy. That's where the word sanctification comes from. And he's saying sanctify them by your word. Make them holy by using your word. And just as, you know, when you clean a cup, sometimes you use a cup and then you clean it, right? To prepare for what? For it to be used again. In the same way, God cleanses us with his word. In order to use us. See. So now the creed doesn't only say. That it's a holy church. But it says the holy Catholic church. And here's a phrase that brings. Much controversy right. What is a Catholic church. What is. What does it mean to be a Catholic believer. If you are from a Spanish descent. Like we are you know. 98 point something percent of everybody in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic go to the Roman Catholic Church. They are Catholics. And so we're used to listening to that name from the Roman Catholic Church, but that is not the meaning of the word Catholic in the creed that we're studying. See, the word Catholic comes from a, from a Greek word that literally means universal or concerning the whole. It means universal or concerning the whole. And back, way back then in the second century, they used to use the word Catholic to refer to all the believers. That's the word they used. But then later on, the Roman church adopted that name and put it into its name, the Roman Catholic Church. And so to avoid confusion, people started talking about the universal church. You probably have heard the term, the universal church. And they started using that term just to avoid confusion between one and the other. Okay, so today, as we talk about the Catholic Church, we are talking about the gathering. We're talking about the ecclesia of all believers in Christ through all the ages. Okay? Jesus himself said that, that one day he will come with the sound of the trumpet and he will do what? He will gather, it says. He will call out his people. And we will be assembled. And for the first time, you're going to see all the past, all the present, and all the future believers in Christ in one place at one time. That is the Catholic Church. That is the universal church, if you would. Okay? That will be his church. And we see here in verses 26 and 27 the attributes of the body of Christ. He says to make her holy, right, on verse 26. Then on verse 27 he says to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now I want to make a point here because this can create some confusion. I want to make sure we're clear. Positionally, every Christian is already there. Okay, positionally, when I become a son of the Most High God, when I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, spiritually speaking, I am already holy. Amen? I am a saint, the Bible says. The Bible calls them to the saints in the churches, right? uses the word saint. I am a saint because I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And positionally, we are already there. But practically, practically, we're still going through the process of sanctification. You see, I'm not as holy practically as I'm going to be one day. Okay? I still think things that I shouldn't think. I still do things that I shouldn't do. See, but one day, at the Lord's return, we're, be, we're going to be both positionally and physically holy. Amen? One day we're going to be holy and pure before a holy God and a pure God. So to say that I believe in the holy Catholic church or the holy universal church is to say this. is to say that I believe in Jesus Christ. As the foundation of the church, which is composed of all believers who truly trust him as Savior and Lord through all the ages. That's what that means. Okay? And I'm going to tell you something. One of the huge differences between that church and the local representation is this. 
that church is only going to be composed of saints, of people that truly believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. In our local congregation, in a congregation of this size, you're going to have people that believe and people that don't believe. And then you're going to have people that think they believe, but they really don't believe. You see, not all of us will be a part of the universal church. If you ever saw the movie Left Behind, or if you ever seen any of those things when the people I get taken, right? There's a lot of people stay around going, whoa, what happened with me? Right? That's the difference. But listen, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you in here today. See, we want you to be a part of this local church. Because we want to help you get to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. See, we believe that there's no other way to earn the grace of God but through the work of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that. But then some of you are going to say, okay, Jose, I believe in everything you said. So I'm going to tell my wife, you know, honey, from now on, I'm not coming to this church. Because I am part of the universal church. So I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to wait for Jesus' return. So when he called me, I'll be part of the church. Right? No, it doesn't work that way. As we wait for the Christ returns, we have work to do right here on earth. See, we have a purpose. Brad was talking about that Christ has created each and every one of us for a purpose. And as we wait for his return, as we wait for the reality of that universal church, we have a work to do here in this community right now. And that's why I love the other part of what it says there. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. See, because then we have to talk about the local body of Christ. See, just as the Santiago Santos family is the local representation of my family, Hollywood Community Church is the local representation of that body of Christ. The local church. And God has given us guidelines to follow and the purpose for this local church. So if you will go with me to Ephesians 4, just turn one page towards the left on your Bible. Go to Ephesians 4. I'm going to start on verse 11. And it says this on verse 11. It says, it was he, Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until when? Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, then... We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in the deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So what is the purpose then of the local body of Christ? What is the purpose of Hollywood Community Church? And I think our purpose statement says it best and very clearly. It says Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. Can you repeat that with me this morning? Hollywood Community Church exists to glorify God, make disciples, and serve others. Can't be any clearer than that. I don't know who wrote that, but that was brilliant. <laughs> let's see that in this passage. Okay, let's see what the passage says. Verse 12 says that God gave all of those gifts, verse 12, to prepare God's people. Your first blank there is equip. We are here to equip the people. We are here to equip the people. You see, here in HCC, we want to help you become the person that God wants you to be. You have heard Pastor Brian say it all the time. We want to help you go on the walk of your spiritual walk and take you from one place to the next. If you're point A on your walk, 
we want to take you to point B. If you're a point D, we want to take you to point E. If you're a point W, we want to take you to point Y. Our purpose here is to help you move along your Christian walk and to help you grow and mature. That is the purpose of the local church. For what? He says that the purpose is to prepare God's people for works of service. We equip, equip you for what? To serve others. To serve others. We don't equip you so you have a lot of knowledge. We don't give you knowledge so you just have that. We equip you so you can serve others. Do the work of the ministry or works of service. We want you to be involved in the work of the ministry. Man, if you are not involved in the work of Hollywood Community Church, my goodness, you should. The youth needs you, the children need you, the adults need you. Get involved in the work of the ministry. Be an imitator of Christ. Christ said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So let's be an imitator of Christ. And the third thing is to make disciples. Look at it on verse 13 and verse 15. It says, until we all reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of Son of God and become mature. Our purpose is to help you become mature. Then again in verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up. We are here to make disciples. And as we make disciples, it says there, the body of Christ grows. It doesn't say the body of Hollywood Community Church grows. It says the body of Christ. You know, I was hearing to this little joke. I'm, I'm not a good teller of jokes, but uh, I was hearing this joke the other day, and, and there were three pastors talking about this rat problem they had at church. And one pastor said, man, I can't get rid of these rats. And, and the pastor is saying, man, I, I call all the exterminators. We do everything we can. I take them in my car, drop them off, and by the time I get back to church, they're there again. I can't get rid of them. So the, the other pastor says, man, I, I tried blowing them up. I got my shotgun, and I was just shooting out all of them. You know what I ended up with, right? A bill to repair my temple. And the rats are still there. And the third pastor said, well, I don't have a rat problem in my church. He said, really, you don't? No. And what I do, I baptize them all, and they, they leave. <laughs> and sometimes it seems to us like we do that, right? People come here, accept the Lord, we baptize him, and then we don't see him again. But Christ is growing his church. See, the purpose of us is not baptizing so they stay here and we have 3,000, 10,000 people, though we would love to see that. But the purpose is to grow the church of God. We're building his kingdom, not this kingdom. Amen. Amen. And I hope you understand that reality today. Because some of us bicker between one church and the other. We look at Sheridan Hills or a Taft Baptist or a New Testament. Oh, man, those church, those people, man. Listen, we're all part of the same body. We're swinging for the same goal. All right? So we must function locally, physically, as the body of Christ. And those that come into this gathering, the people that don't know Christ, when they come in here, they should see the character of God reflected in us. They should feel the love of Christ when they come in here. They should know that we believe in Jesus Christ. So that, that is the ministry of the local body. That is why we believe in the communion of the saints, in the gathering or fellowship of the believers in a local place. And that's your point number four, the communion of the saints. Okay, so now that, now that we believe and we understand what the Holy Catholic Church means, and I hope we all understand that, how do I find... A holy church. How do I know when I walk into a church building that actually that is a holy church? How do I know that this is a body that believes in Jesus Christ? Because we have many churches out there that we shouldn't be even visiting. Okay? So I'm going I'm to give you three things. Uh, but first of all, I want to I read you a definition of a church. Uh, I'm going to read you two definitions. One is called the Lutheran Statement of Faith. But it's also known as the Augsburg Confession of 1530. And uh, there's some, uh, some words in there that we don't 
quite agree, but I, I just want you to listen with it. Stay with me, okay? We'll try to clarify it all. But this thing, in talking about the church, he says the church is the congregation of the saints in which the gospel is rightly taught and the sacraments are rightly administered. Okay, he's mentioning two things here that the church of God should be doing. One is the word should be preached or taught. And the second one, the second one his, his word is sacraments. We call them ordinances, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the sacraments or the ordinances are rightly administered. The second definition is from John Calvin. And he also uses the word sacrament, but we'll explain. It says, wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, and the sacraments administered according to Christ's institution, there it is not to be doubted, a church of God exists. Those are good definitions of the church. Now I want to clarify um, the word sacrament in a minute, but as you can see, the first thing he mentions is the preaching of the word of God. And as we saw, it's the preaching of the word of God that cleanses us to become holy. Okay, so if you go to a place where there is no preaching of the word of God, even though the guy is really, really good and he's giving you a great message and a motivational speech, if he is not mentioning the word of God, listen, get out or turn the TV off. Okay, because the first thing that there has to happen in a gathering of believers is that there's preaching and teaching of the word of God. Now, the Lutheran statement and Calvin both mentioned the sacraments, and I want to clarify this. We call them the ordinances. Okay, and the reason for that is that the sacraments is something that is seen as needed in order to earn the grace of God. Okay, when they talk about sacraments, the word comes from the word sacred, they see it as a need for you to be saved. And I want to make this very clear this morning. You do not need to take the Lord's Supper to be saved. And you do not need to be baptized to be saved. Okay, we are only saved by the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ. There is nothing you can do, nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to earn salvation. So if today you're here and you're trying to say, okay, how can I be, become a member of this holy Catholic church that sounds so good? By accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. You can't do anything else. It's not by taking the juice and the cracker that we're going to take in a moment. And it's not by getting baptized. That's why we don't call it a sacrament. Okay? And I just want to make that distinction. The two ordinances that we follow, there are two. The first one is baptism. Jesus gave us a clear command in the Bible to go and make disciples. He said, he said go make disciples and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here at HCC, we follow that command. And every third Sunday of the month, we baptize people. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the church you go to has to do baptism on a monthly basis, okay? We become legalistic if we start thinking that way. But they have to be doing it sometime or another. Somebody has to be getting baptized. All right? Somebody has to be getting baptized. The second one is the Lord's Supper. And later on today, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper. Jesus, as he left, he, gets, he gave this instruction to his disciples and threw them to us. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I did by taking the Lord's Supper. And here at Hollywood Community Church, we do that every fourth Sunday of the month. Again, you don't have to go to a church that does it on a monthly basis. But somewhere, sometime, somehow they got to do it. If you go to church for a whole year and they not, haven't done it and you go to another year, they haven't, question it, please. Ask some questions, okay? Two things that have to be happen, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So if you're looking for a church today, if you're looking for a holy Catholic church, if you're looking for a local representation of the body of Christ, I'm going to suggest that you look for three things, Okay? And I could have added prayer in there. It could have been four. But let me put three things. First one is that they're preaching and teaching the word of God. Make sure that's going on. If that's not going on, get out. Okay, if you come here Sunday after Sunday, Brian or, or Brad or myself or Thomas, we don't open the word of God and read from it, either tell me or get out, one or the other, you know. We have deacons 
and elders around this place that part of, of, of the mandate that Pastor Brian has given them is to make sure that what we're teaching up here comes from the Word of God. And if it's not, they are to confront us and let us know. Because we want to make sure that the teaching in this church comes from the Word of God and not from Jose's ideas. Those are pretty bad. All right. The second thing is the observance of the ordinances. The observance of the ordinances. And the third one is the opportunities to serve. We read it there in Ephesians 4. The equipping of the saints is for the works of service. So the, the church that you go to, the ecclesia has to give you opportunities to serve. And again, I'm going to tell you this. If you are not involved in church serving in Hollywood Community Church, man, get involved. We have so much to do. You can teach a class. Soon we're going to start revamping the life groups. Here in September, we start new life groups. Come lead a life group. Teach a class. Come pray with somebody. Come serve food to somebody on a Saturday. Go prayer walking with the team one day. Come and get involved. Now I'm almost at the end, so bear with me here for a minute. I know... A lot of us learn in different ways. Some of us are auditory. Some of us are visual. And I don't want anybody to leave here this place without understanding today's message. So if you will stay with me, watch a video. It's a two-minute video, and then we're done. Okay? Watch this two-minute video with me, please. Churches are full of people. The broken, the lonely, the wanderers, the hopeful, the enthusiastic, the lost, the passionate, and the faithful. For many, this gathering represents the whole of their church experience. They'll listen attentively to a message, they'll sing a few songs, they'll be invited to pray, and then they'll return to their lives. But for some, questions will start bubbling to the surface of their faith. Is this the extent of what Jesus intended for his followers? Who is the church for? Why does the world need the church, and what is the church after all? Well, the church isn't the building where people attend weekly services. It's not a program, a list of rules, or a philosophy. The church isn't a political affiliation, a country club, or a holiday tradition. The church was never intended to be just an assembly of people wearing nice clothes and saying nice things. The church is all the followers of Jesus everywhere. The Greek word for church is the word ekklesia. It's the combination of two words, ek, which means out, and kaleo, meaning called. Thus, the church, the ekklesia, means the called out ones. In other words, the church, the collective body of all the followers of Jesus everywhere, is called out by someone for something for a purpose. The beginning of the book of Acts has Jesus calling his disciples to a task, bringing something called the gospel, the good news, to all the world. And this gospel would go out to all the outsiders, the forgotten, the abandoned, and the excluded. And they, those outsiders, would see and receive that good news as actually good. And when Jesus talked about the gospel, it was always in conjunction with something else, something called the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God's purposes are made apparent. There's justice and righteousness. There's hope for the poor and for the oppressed. And under the kingdom of God, mercy and forgiveness take precedence over bitterness and resentment. Now, people previously deemed to be far from God are brought into his family, adopted as his sons and daughters. And the fullness of the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is not merely expressed as a way for people to escape an evil world when they die. Rather, the good news of God's kingdom is about the announcement of God's eternity moving into the present world and carrying on into the life to come. The people who belong to Jesus join him in his worldwide restoration project. And the called out ones, the church, are committed to advancing this good news of God's kingdom into the world. Not as a means of helping people avoid the world, but rather to see God's kingdom life being made real here and now. The whole church with the power of the whole gospel for the whole world. That's what we've been called to be. And I'm going to finish with one quote. Canon Ernest Southcott, he's the founder of the home church movement in England, said this, and I think it's great. The only word there, sacrament, is the only one I don't agree with, but said the holiest moment of the church service. Think about that. What is the holiest moment of the church service? It says, is the moment when God's people, strengthened by preaching and sacrament, go out of the church door into the world to be the church. 
We don't go to church. We are the church. Amen? I want to invite you to be a part of our church. I want you to be a part of this local body of believers, a part of my local family. But more importantly, I want you to be a part of the body of Christ. Where it's here someplace else, it doesn't matter. We just want you to be a part of the body of Christ. And it's only done by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm.